Thanks very much. Uh, well, this is a bit of amusing work I did with my colleague and friend, Richard, and Richard Mann, while he was waiting for his ch first child to be born. So it was a very exciting <laughs> race, which the paper won by about three days. So it was a bit hurried, but it's a lot of fun. And if you want to read the paper, it's on the bio archive, although we're about to do a big <coughs> update. So what is this talk about? So patterns of diversification through time, of course, have been of endearing interest and uh, enduring interest for a long time for paleontologists, ever since uh, Phillips uh, and others noticed that there were some very big bulges in patterns of diversification through time, which is how we ended up with things like the, uh, the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. And of course, typical features that we as paleobiologists are interested in are things like uh, major radiations and mass extinctions. And it's also been pointed out many times that these two things often go hand in hand. Often after mass extinction, we notice a sort of a rebound effect. And of course, we've got lots of ideas about why that might happen. Here are some pictures, I think, from Benton, maybe. Uh, maybe. Benton, um, showing typical patterns of diversification through time. And of course, uh, a lot of ink has been spilt trying to understand why we get these very striking uh, patterns. Um, and what we want to do in this talk is to show that these may be extremely misleading. Um, and in fact, we should not necessarily be trying to explain these patterns in the way that we typically do. Of course, I'm going to take an example of the Cameron explosion, because uh, it's still something I occasionally look at. Um, and uh, here is a rubbery, a rubber version of Anomalicaris. Uh, and uh, you know, this is a typical view um, of, notice this is a very interesting one, this is the, um, the modern day phylogeny mapped onto uh, geological time. And you see uh, that, uh, yeah, you see everything sort of happens in this sort of big bang very quickly at the beginning of the Cambrian or before, if we believe certain lines of evidence, which we've already heard about. I don't believe them, of course. But. Um, so we want to ask, you know, people in the Cambrian explosion community and other types of community are constantly answering, asking these kinds of questions. Why do the animals all appear at the same time? Why do the body plans and the crown groups appear so early on in the history of the clades? And then why does nothing appear to happen afterwards? You know, you get this enormous radiation of everything and then you get a very long four or five hundred million years of not very much happening, allegedly, anyway. I mean, you get things like insects and mammals. Uh, so, of course, uh, there's a, especially in Elsevier journals, uh, there's an awful lot of papers published. Uh, I recommend uh, Gondwana research for, for some amusing Christmas reading about why these things actually take place. And some of them are just, some of them are crazy. I mean, they're really, some of them are really bonkers and some of them are quite sensible. Uh, but they kind of revolve around two versions. First of all, kind of um, sort of uh, ecological arguments about empty niches, and this happens after mass extinctions as well. There's sort of a free for all to fill up all the space. And secondly, another favourite one is the genes did it in a very unclear kind of way. And people may know what I think about these things, uh, but I'll just carry on going. So uh, Julia um, uh, Sigwell, in her great talk yesterday, introduced the modelling process we're going to be looking at for the rest of this talk, which is the idea of birth-death uh, models, which are enormously widely used in all sorts of diversification models. So basically, in a, a birth-death model, you take a species and you assign it a certain value of either splitting into two or dying, well, that's birth or death, uh, in, in, in each uh, time interval. You can call this uh, lambda and mu, or mu and lambda. So obviously, therefore, the rate of the diversification is lambda minus nu mu, the rate of producing species minus the rate in which they go extinct. And you can model this as a, this is a continuous time Markov process, and it generates a zero-banded exponential geometric distribution, which means that you start off with not very many, and you end up with an awful lot, is the basic background for that. This is what the maths, a bit of the maths looks like, just to show that Richard did some work. It's very good. And we're taking a statistical approach, which means we're not just trying to infer central values, but we're trying to look at the range of possible outcomes that these kinds of models can generate. So this is a typical kind of birth-death um, process type output. This was by Slater et al. in Evolution a few years ago. And it shows all these branches um, appearing and disappearing, as you'd expect. And uh, you can... My amazing animation has worked. Uh, I'm not very good at these. Um, this is a, if, you, if we take a time slice, say 15 million years ago, we can count up two different things here. We can count the number of species there are at that particular time, and that counts everything there. 
And you can also count out the number of lineages. And the number of lineages are the things that are going to give rise eventually to things living today. So that's like if you just did a phylogeny based on the living things, that's the number of lines on the phylogeny that would be cut by the blue line at that point. So they're two different measures. And of course, everything is a species. Um, and a subset of them are the lineages as well. Now, kind of naively, when you go into this field, you might think that when you look at the rate of diversification through time, it's going to look like this. In other words, this is a, a log scale up here, and this is the uh, number of species through time, starting off, say, 500 million years ago. And uh, the slope of lambda minus mu, you'd expect sort of a steady accumulation on a log scale like this. And that's sort of how you think it's going to be. But in fact, this isn't. This is what the Yule process gives, which I think Julia also mentioned very briefly. The Yule process is a way of modeling birth death processes when you don't have any extinction. I, this is what happens in molecular phylogenies, because obviously nothing can go and extinct in a molecular phylogeny, because it, all the things, branches lead to living things. Uh, and actually, the big thing here, what we want to talk about, is the idea of survivorship bias. In other words, when you have extinction, it gets really hard to survive. So most clades will go extinct very quickly whenever you have any kind of um, significant extinction rate. So as a result, in order to get going, to survive those tricky early years when you don't have very many lineages or species around, you have to, have, you have to get lucky. You have to, it's like rolling a dice. You need to roll, say, 10 sixes in a row. It's not impossible, uh, but if you do that, you get off to a flying start. And this has been called the push of the past, and that's what this talk is about. So now it comes onto some graphs and stuff. I'm sorry there aren't any pictures of fossils apart from the rubber anomalocaris, which is quite nice. Um, so uh, we can now plot two different things when we have extinction. So the red line is the number of lineages through time that will lead to living things. And they're linear at first. When you get right up to the recent, Everything gets really weird. You get what's called the pull of the present. And basically, there's not enough time for anything to go extinct anymore, so everything survives. So you're meant to get this enormous radiation of species as we approach the present. In fact, when you get to molecular phylogenies, typically you don't see this effect. And there's been a lot of interesting discussion about why not. And uh, by the way, Rachel Warnock will give a, what looks like a very interesting talk in this equivalent time slot tomorrow when she'll be talking about the speciation problem. The blue line, on the other hand, is this the raw count of species through time. And as you can see, when you have extinction, you have to have this huge burst at the beginning before everything settles down to middle-aged obscurity uh, further on. And therefore, if you look at the observed diversification rate, when you have extinction, you get this enormously high rate of uh, diversification at the beginning, which then goes slump back down quite quickly. So, in other words, Inevitably, any large clades that survive to the present almost certainly have to have a huge burst of diversification at the beginning. It's just the nature of the things. So you don't need to explain it necessarily. It just has to be there. Notice also that in the 95% confidence intervals here, there's an awful lot of slop in these models. So there's a really huge range of things that can happen. So in the normal, in the straight line model, or in the um, rather the, the central model, we expect in our uh, parameters we're using here, the initial diversification is actually 100 times the background rate of diversification. It's actually enormous. But if we go up to the top of the, um, the confidence interval, it can go up to 300 times. So in other words, this homogeneous model can give rise to an enormous range of possible outcomes. So just to come up with, uh, uh, round up what I've said there, the blue lines are just the number of species through time, and they live and die at a rate uh, determined by lambda mu. The red lines are the immortal lineages leading to the present day. They have to be immortal because we know, we recognize them retrospectively. We draw lines backwards from the things that survive today. That's how we recognize them. And they normally diversify at a rate of lambda minus mu. And in our model we're using, we have 10,000 species. Mu is 0.5. That means each species lasts about 2 million years on average. And lambda is calculated to be about 0.5107, so a little bit more. So the paradox is that the higher the extinction rates are, the harder it is to survive at the beginning. But if you do, 
um, you end up with far more species uh, than otherwise. So it's sort of, it's like a really super uh, competition thing that only amazingly successful clades will survive. So the worst the conditions are, the fewer things that will survive, but the ones that do will be absolutely enormous. So in other words, the clades that actually survived are pretty rare. Only a few percent in our um, modeling actually survived to the present day. But one of the, um, one of the interesting things about the push of the past, which hasn't really been discussed, is that because 500 million years ago is a very long time, and the average plesian, so the average branch that actually goes extinct, only survives about 8 million years, it follows that you have to keep on getting lucky almost your entire history. It's not just at the beginning, but along the lineage that leads up to the present day, there's a sort of a fractal, a constant renewing of the push of the past. You can't let go for an instant. And I'll show you an example of what happens when you do let, stop concentrating, so to speak, uh, later on. And you get this really great, you get this really fantastic view of the fossil record. So this is a chunk through a stem group and the, the green bits are plesians and they're sort of splitting to paraplesians at a rate of um, lambda. And along the lineage, it turns out that if you look at the maths, you get a rate of diversification, uh, diversification of exactly two lambda along the lineages. Uh, of course, there is no extinction along here because we know that they lasted until the present day. So we know the, the exact rate of speciation on average is two lambda, whereas these things are speciating and then going extinct as well. So, and of course, we can't see these red lines in general. They're hidden inside the cladogram, so to speak. We can only reconstruct it. Oops. Uh, when we get to mass extinctions, we get a similar effect. This slightly confusing diagram is meant to show that, suppose you have an enormous mass extinction and we're left with only one or two species of a clade that survive. Then assuming that they did survive, as you increase the background extinction rate, you end up having to have had, uh, you have to have a, a big diversification at the beginning in order to survive. So in other words, after mass extinctions, you like reset the clock and then it gets really hard to uh, survive again. So therefore you expect to see an analogous effect to what you get at the beginning of major radiations. So you can see it, you can think of radiations or the evolution in general, like a sort of a, a, an insulating cable around a red, red hot uh, wire. The wire is the sort of the stem lineages which are radiating at a crazily fast rate, but we don't see them. We only see the plesians, the extinct lineages that are being thrown off and which make the fossil record in general. And it's only at the beginning and at the end and after mass extinctions, when all these, these obscuring clouds are blown away, that we get to glimpse into these, like this red hot radiation that's going on the whole time. So perhaps we can explain a lot of these patterns of the fossil record simply by imposing this survivorship um, criterion on it, especially these big rebounds after the mass extinctions and the cabinet explosion. I'm just going to talk about one more thing. Can I? Yes, please. A two minutes. So uh, this is just to show the average, when crown groups appear, uh, they appear more or less as the diversification rate drops with the push of the past. So in, a, in terms of looking for what's going on when, um, we should be looking in the crown, in the stem group uh, to uh, find most of the push of the past. There's just one thing I want to talk about very quickly. By the way, the lungfish data shows exactly this effect of all the rates, the higher rates leading up to the present are concentrated in the stem and not in the plesians. Oh, I've still got a bit of time. Uh, <laughs> so the, most, the last thing I want to say is what happens when you get really big, big uh, clades. When you've got huge clades, uh, there's only one way to do it, and that's to have a bulge in the rate of lineage production as well. Um, and this is a very interesting fact, which has also hardly been noticed. And when you do this, it turns out it's likely that this is going to affect things like estimates of molecular clock uh, uh, times of origin and things like this, because this is affecting the lineages that survive until today. So this is a very, also a very important effect that, has, uh, that affects molecular phylogenies rather than the fossil record. So we can see these survivorship um, effects um, having a balanced effect in both the fossil record, the bulk diversification rates, and also in the lineages. So I'll just skip to the uh, end. So we see the... Um, uh, these enormously high uh, rates actually in the published literature, for example, these are the molecular clock rates for 
arthropods, as published by Mike Lee. It all makes sense. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the push to past, we, we collapse into the present, we lose our ability to look into the future, and we just end up with millions and millions and millions of species. Um, and we can't, of course, predict what's going to happen. We no longer have, have our ability to see what's going to happen. Uh, so, uh, therefore, what do we expect from the push to the past? We expect bursts of evolution uh, at the beginning of radiation after mass extinctions, high rates of morphological change and early establishment of crown group uh, body plans, slowdowns in molecular rates through time in big clades. And the take home message is this in orange. Large successful clades, such as the arthropods, are very, very lucky, and they are not at all, or should not be taken, as general examples of what happens in major radiations. You also have to look at all the losers that didn't make it very far. So although everyone likes to take big successful clades as this stands proxy for this radiation, they're in fact the worst possible things to choose. And on that cheerful note, I've chosen picture, uh, fossils. Uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>